Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, everybody, thanks for coming. Can you hear me? Nobody says no. Uh, tonight's meeting is going to be about the, the earliest and the oldest cemetery in Newfield. It's over on Bank Street. I don't know, if, does everybody know where that is or not? I guess. Uh, we're going to discuss the history of that old cemetery. We're going to talk about the burials, some of the people that are buried in there, and we're going to talk about the stones that mark those folks' graves. We're also going to discuss a little bit about early cemetery or burial practices. They're very different than what I originally thought they were. Totally different, so we're going to discuss that some and a little bit of the history of the village. Uh, also, when we get going, I, I don't want this to be me up here speaking the whole time. If you have questions or comments, please uh, raise your hand or make yourself known. This wants to be a, a, a group effort, not just me up here talking. So, and I'm sure any comments or questions you'd have are, are probably things I wouldn't think of saying, so please speak up. Uh, let me see, I grew up three houses down the road from that cemetery. So as long as I can remember, I knew that cemetery was there. I had to walk past it on the way to school. I had to walk past it on the way home from school. Uh, so it was, it was like it was always there. Also, as a young kid, I was always curious about the old people, the people that uh, lived in our house before we did, the people that lived in our neighbors' houses before they did. Uh, I wondered who had the businesses over town, who ran them. I was just curious about the people that were before us. I wanted to know what their names were. I wanted to know what they looked like. I wanted to know what they did what they thought. I just kind of was aware of them and I wanted to know about them. So a curiosity that pretty much went unsatisfied. But when I was in the fourth grade, again I walked past that cemetery at least twice a day, when I was in the fourth grade I started to go in the cemetery and I thought I'm going to copy every name and all the dates off all the stones in that cemetery. So on the way home from school, that was a while ago, but on the way home from school, I'd stop in there and I'd write three or four names down and three or four sets of dates. Then I had a sheet I kept at home. It was past people in Newfield was the heading. And every night I'd add a few names to it. That didn't go too awfully long because a couple neighborhood boys were running around in there. And one of them bumped a stone and the, an ornament fell off the top of the stone and hit one on the head. And uh, well, Johnny Van Epps. Who remember Johnny Van Epps? And so he had to go to the hospital, and that was the end of me copying those stones in the fourth grade. So time went on, and uh, I really had nobody to talk to about the old things or didn't know of anybody. But then when I was a senior in high school, I found out that my grandmother knew a great deal about the local folks. She lived in Newfield all of her life. She actually was born in the same house. She died in 87 years later. So. I went to see her, uh, and since our family didn't have a car, I had to ride my bicycle up to the Van Kirk Road, up the Van Kirk Road to her house to see her. But she started telling me about these folks, uh, names and details I'd never heard of. And uh, one thing she told me about, well, some of the first people she told me about was uh, James Ford and Hannah Ford, Davin, or Hannah Davenport Ford. and. Uh, she told me about them. She told me what color James Ford's hair was uh, and lots of details. Well, I got to start showing pictures here. I forgot about them. Space bar. Oh, there's the cemetery right there. Now, does that look familiar to people? And that's taken from the west. What am I doing wrong here, Glenn? Hit the space bar again, just hit every time. Oh, now there's a nice view of the cemetery from the inside of it. Isn't that a nice photograph? Very old cemetery. 
Now there's James Ford. Now he's the gentleman that my grandmother told me about. She told me about uh, he had reddish brown hair. She told me that uh, he wore it in a single braid down the back of his head. Uh, he was also Irish. He, came from, he was born in Ireland, so she told me that he had such an Irish brogue that people that didn't know him well could not understand him. But notice he died in 1825. So that was an incredibly long time ago, but yet the way she talked about him, he was a real person. Now, my grandmother knew personally his daughter. Now that doesn't seem to bring 200 years together. But my grandmother knew a lot about him because she personally knew him, talked with his daughter about him. What button did I do here? <laughs> oh, then now there's his wife, Hannah. And she also knew of Hannah. Her name was Hannah Davenport. She outlived James by 17 years. And uh, James Ford and Hannah moved to Newfield in 1812. And they built a log cabin up on Birch Hill. And we have the people here tonight to own and live in that house, Karen and Dan Kennerson. And are, is it possible to see parts of that log cabin in that house still? But the cabin is still there. It just got built over. And uh, my grandmother also knew about Hannah Ford. She said that uh, one of the things Hannah was noted for is she had a set of six fine chairs, which was quite rare for, I, I think, in a log cabin. And uh, my grandmother said that ladies would come and visit, and they would tell Hannah that she had the easiest setting chairs that they'd ever sat in. And here's one of them. My grandmother gave me two of them, and this is the one that is in the better condition. But things like this just made me realize that these people were real people, and they're not that far away. So there's Hannah Ford's chair, one of her six chairs. And I can tell you more about the chairs, but it's not worth it, I reckon. Uh, well, I went back and told my grandmother I found where James and Hannah Ford were buried. And she started telling me about more people. And so I had to go back down to the cemetery and find those too. And so I was all pleased with myself. It was probably their son and their son's family. And so I went back to my grandmother and told her I found those. And so she told me some more names. So I went back and so, and you know, it took a while to find them. But after a few trips like that, I thought, I'm going to beat this. I'm just going to copy every inscription on every stone in that cemetery. So next Thursday, 50 years ago, November 28, 1963, I started copying the stones up in the northwest corner. So it seems to and I have my records right here that I cop copied 50 years ago. I don't feel that old, but there they are. If you want to look at them later. Uh, so I copied every stone. I started November 28th. Thanksgiving 50 years ago fell on the same date that it does this year. And I copied a few stones a night all through the winter. I couldn't keep very warm, so I couldn't copy that many. But by the next February, I had every stone copied in that cemetery. And I found 419 stones with inscriptions and 545 marked burials. Oh, I'm forgetting this. Now, I copied every stone in there, and then my grandmother started telling me about other people in other cemeteries. So that spring, I moved on to another cemetery. And within a year and a half, I copied every stone in every cemetery in Newfield. One thing I want to show you. See, now here's the cemetery right there. Can you see it? And just to the west of it, is a school. Now in 1866, that was just about the last year that school existed, or maybe it wasn't even uh, an operating school at that time. But the village started on the eastern half of this map here. The early mills, the early inn, uh, everything was really on the eastern half. So the cemetery and the school were pretty much in the center of the village at that time. 
And I'm going to get into that more later. Now, one thing about the village cemetery, it was right next to the school. Now, this is the Sebring Corner Cemetery. Recognize that? That was also next to a school. So of the 11 cemeteries I copied in Newfield, six of them started next to schools. Oop. Not ready yet. So uh, after I had copied every stone in every cemetery in Newfield, I began to see real patterns. Uh, when I first started, I thought, if I copy every stone in that Bank Street Cemetery, I will have a record of every person that ever lived and died in Newfield Village. Well, that was about the farthest from the truth that I could possibly be. Uh, but after I got done copying every stone in the town of Newfield, well, I, I found things that I never dreamt existed. Now, one thing, I also started to learn more about history, and I found that in 1814, the population in the town of Newfield went past 1,000. In 1820, the federal census showed there were over 1,900 people in the town of Newfield. Now, since I had every copy of every stone in the town of Newfield, I could figure things out. I also found that before 1820, there were only two properly marked graves in all of Newfield. So there was a real contradiction there. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, just for the sake of this meeting, and I pretty much knew what my results were going to be, but I went through and I wrote down in all the cemeteries I copied every grave that was 1835 or earlier. And in the town of Newfield, I found 81 of them. So then just for the sake to find out what the life expectancy was, I took, put, put the ages in order, and I took number 41 out of 81. There were 40 people in the front half that were age 25 or younger. So the life expectancy at that time was 25 years old maximum. Now in the early years, they would tend to have a stone for their spouse or parent much more than they would have a stone for a child. Now when you got up until the 1830s, things were more socially and economically developed in Newfield so uh, they would tend to have stones for children more. So I, I took, there was 26 stones in the old Bank Street Cemetery from 1830 to 1835, 26 of them. The 13 youngest people with those stones was five years old, five years old and younger. The oldest 13 was well, well, there was really nobody from six to eight, so it was nine years old and older for the oldest 13. And it was only, of those 26, only five lived beyond the age of 33. So even when I was copying, I began to realize that the poor folks buried in that cemetery, that was not a cemetery of aged, that was a cemetery of children and young people. Very surprising to me. But then on the other, the other side, where were all these, if the life expectancy was 25 years or younger in 1820, statistically you should have had 80 deaths and burials just in that year. And in 1814 you'd have had 40 or more. So really up to 1820, statistically you should have had several hundred deaths and burials, but before 1820 there was only two stones in the whole town of Newfield. So any guesses, why would that be? Anybody have an idea? Right, but where would they bury them? Right in the yard, right the front yard. That's what my grandmother told me. She said a lot of the children were buried in the front of the house next to the path to the road. But you also think of a cemetery, it's really an organized, uh, centralized place where the community buries its dead. But in the early settlement, people didn't have that in mind. Now, they started one in the village because that was more of a centralized uh, location. But out in the country, they didn't have that many people. They just simply buried their people anywhere. So for the first 20 years, 
And even well beyond that, the people simply buried their dead on their property. And there wasn't such a thing as a cemetery. Also, the word cemetery, I think of all these things I want to tell you, and I'm not going to remember to tell you a lot of them, but the word cemetery is a newer word. What would they have called the old cemetery on Bank Street to start with? Any idea? Say it. Burial ground. Burial ground. Yeah, these were burial grounds. They weren't cemeteries. Okay. <clears throat> we got a lot more pictures to go here. Oh, now there's the oldest stone in the Bank Street Cemetery. Can you read that pretty well? You can't? <laughs> Here's a better picture. Now you can see January, oh, I just got the edge of the end. It's January 3rd, 1813, in memory of, can you see that? And there's his name. There's his name and his age. S.W. Rogers, age 11 months, 14 days. And Rosemary, she found it on the internet somehow. She found that that was Samuel Warren Rogers, and the son of Samuel K. Rogers, uh, who owned a mill just below the Bowstring Arch Bridge, no, just above the Bowstring Arch Bridge. So that's the first marked burial. Now, on one of those handouts you picked up, if you did, it says the first schoolhouse was a log structure erected about 1805 or 1806. It was succeeded by the old yellow schoolhouse, uh, and in it were held all sorts of public meetings from religious work, worship to political gatherings. Oh, I got to tell you about that a little bit too. One of the reasons that they had cemeteries near schools is because they did. They had their religious and their worship services in the school. The churches didn't come for years later. And the people wanted to have their gatherings. They might not have had a real church organization, so they had missionaries coming through, itinerant ministers coming through. So they held their church services in the schools. Now there was a, Lockery Van Kirk, I don't know, a lot of you remember Lockery. He died 29 years ago next month. But Lockery and I went all over creation. And one place we went to was up in Herkimer to visit his cousin. She was born in 1883 and she lived to celebrate her 110th birthday. But we go see Dora Decker, and she grew up down in Jackson Hollow, and she went to school down there, and she told Lockery and I about when they would shut the school down to have a funeral in the school. So it was done, and that's why the cemeteries were next to the schools. So is the yellow schoolhouse still standing? Oh, no. It's long gone. Where it was in the very western part of the cemetery, up toward the road a bit, as far as I can tell. But it was right where the burials are now. It was not to the west of it. It was the school stood right in the present cemetery. And we'll get into that a bit. But they moved the school down. After the cemetery bought the schoolhouse land, they moved the school down to uh, that farm just west of the Gulf Station on top of Newfield Hill. Okay, now here's just a random photograph of the old part of the cemetery. See how the stones are in nice neat rows. There's another one. And so on. They're all nice neat rows. Well, they had no organization at all. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Well, they almost would have had to have uh, hit graves when they went to bury more people because a lot of the graves in there were never marked. So the cemetery originally was a rectangle. And, uh, well, they, they filled it up to some extent. They probably just plain lost track who was buried where because so many graves had no stones. Now, the burials were all made in one direction. Does anybody know what that is? You go to any early cemetery in New York State or anywhere else, they're always buried in one direction. And I know I went wandering around in Dryden looking for a cemetery with a guy, and we got there, and he said, boy, are we lost. And he was trying to figure out with his compass which was east and west. 
I said, you're standing in a compass. Because the symmetries are always exactly one direction. Anybody know what that is? East and west. East and west, yep. The, the head of the person buried was always due west, and their feet were always due east. And I've never known why, but I've read and been told they were buried that way, so if they could sit up in the grave, they would face the sunrise. I don't know. But without any exception at all, the people were always buried exactly east to west. And if you want to take good photographs of a stone, go into the cemetery about noon or 1230. Because the sun is coming right straight out of the south and giving a good shadow across the stone. Now here's a lady. Uh, what? And I didn't pick out the, date, the ages on these, but she was 21 years old when she died. Notice the ornate carving on this. And this is slate. The marble stones didn't come around generally until 1825 because that was the earliest they could get the marble in via the Erie Canal. But here's Abigail, wife of Jared Parsons. Now, every grave had two stones. They had the headstone and the footstone. And the head was placed over the west part of the grave, over the head of the person, and the footstone was over the foot of the person. There's Abigail Parsons' footstone. And see, even that is ornate. And there's a picture of her grave with the headstone and footstone in place. They just marked the head and foot of the grave. I'm not sure why they did it. But, and, you, and you go into a lot of cemeteries and you don't see that, like the Bank Street Cemetery. But if you're able to, you can go along the bank and you'll see where they put the head or the footstones. They got rid of most of them. So this was, a, this was uncommon. I almost went to another cemetery to get a picture of a head and footstone together. But I did find this one. But they took a lot of the footstones and threw them over the bank so it was easier to mow. Oh, now there's another early stone. I didn't count this type of stone with the uh, properly marked burials. But this is another early stone. There's several in the Bank Street Cemetery. And you find them around in other early cemeteries if they haven't uh, not recognized them as an actual burial stone and thrown it across the bank or in a pile. So there's a close-up of it. And many times they put the X between the letters of the, or the initials of the name. So it's D, G, age 68, died 1817. Now this is in the Gillette plot. So I imagine that's some ancestor of the Gillettes that are buried there. And I call it Gillette. Today we pronounce it Gillette. But 150 or 200 years ago, they didn't have accents on syllables. So that's the way they would have pronounced it was Gillette. There was a stone cutter. There were two or three of them. But no, well, they would get the stones and then they just cut them or engrave them. But there was one right where the, uh, the main one was right where the Rodney Heffron's Covered Bridge Market is. Yeah, there were several people that ran it. There's another stone, another early stone. And I took a picture of that at a distance so you could see the shape of the stone and everything, that's what it looks like close up. EB, age 36, 1817. Here's another one. SF for the S backwards, 1827. And that's closer up. Just a crude stone out of the field. Nothing professional at all. Not in any way. Now here's another stone. This stone is consecrated to the memory of Daniel Kellogg, son of Solomon Kellogg, who died June 6, 1828, aged 15 years. And at the bottom, you can't see it, it says, my race is run, yours is running, prepare for death, judgment's coming. <laughs> Which is a very realistic way of looking at it. And also, notice how ornate the carving was. Now that stone was in good shape, but one of those old Norway spruces went down and just clipped the edge of it and knocked the edge off. Very ornate. 
Here's Charles, son of Jacob and Phoebe Plants, two years old. And again, very ornate. It's got kind of some moss on there, but very ornate. Elicum D or Elicum Pangburn, died 1820, age 20 years. Now here's a marble stone, and a lot of the early marble stones had willows on them, willows and urns. Now there's the top of James Ford stone in better detail. That had to have taken a lot of time to do that. Now here's Elizabeth Puff stone, well really Elizabeth Drake, but also very ornate. You could do just about a whole slideshow just looking at those stones. Labor was cheap. A lot of them did it out of love. Yeah. Now that's the middle of Elizabeth Drake's stone. And in the mid to late 40s, they got very fancy with the death dates. But see, that was, that's quite a stone, really, because you look at Henry Drake, that's a very straight levels. The diet is an outline type. The uh, date is a very, it's upper and lower case. Highly serif. The word aged is upper and lower case, and then the age is a very formal, plain, all caps. So all typefaces on that stone. Very elaborate. Oh, how many remember Herbie Drake? That's his ancestor. I think that's Herbie Drake's great-great-grandmother. Now there's her whole stone. Here's another stone, Sidna, wife of Reverend Isaac Parks. And again, it's extremely fancy. When I first copied some of these stones, I couldn't figure out what the dates were. But I got accustomed to it. Can you read that epitaph? Friends and physicians could not save this mortal body from the grave, nor can the grave confine it here when Christ shall call it to appear. Well, I'm not reading it either. I just know what it says. Because <laughs> the bottom goes right below. Now, there's two stones. I got this for a little different reason. The stones are exactly the same. They were put in there at the same time. He died 42 years after his wife. And see, she didn't even have a day on her date, nor the precise age. So they may have forgotten when she died and exactly how old she was. But here's a stone that is much later than her death date. Alan, what would a stone like that cost? Not very much. I've seen where the big square ones were $10. So, you know, at that time, maybe a couple, three dollars. Now, here's another stone. Uh, William Kemp died in 1841, and his wife died in 1892. So it's an 1892 stone. But some, sometimes you'll find older stones around, and what you'll find is William Kemp stone, which they replaced, and they put it somewhere else. And I found stones in garages or any other place, and it's really replacement stones. It's not that somebody stole the stone. It's just they replaced it, and they didn't need it anymore. Now there's another stone, 1840, but that's an 1890s stone. It's a beautiful stone, but it's nowhere near 1840. Oh, stone cutting errors. Now here might be some things that you wouldn't recognize as an error if you went through the cemetery, but after you get, if you copy a 30, 40,000 stones, you. Now there's Penelope, wife of Eli Gregory. Now this is how they would fix a mistake. They would cut the stone deeper till the lettering was gone, and then they'd recover it. So they put Eli Gregory's name in there incorrectly. So that's how they fixed it. Now there's another one. You can't see it so much with the picture, 
But that DeWitt C is very deep into the stone. Now he was 18 years old when he died. And so they apparently spelled his name wrong. And there you got the marble stone, 1837, and you got that willow on there. Now here's another stone. They got the first three lines wrong. His name, son of, and then his parents. So they had to redo all three names, or all three lines. Oh, what's wrong with that one? Can you guys see? What's wrong with George's name? They never opened up the right side of the letter G, the second letter G, so it reads Jork. See, see what I mean? They never engraved the second G correctly. Now what's wrong with that one? <laughs> now here's another one. I got two pictures of this. This was a little girl, Hannah Young. Uh, and many times they would, when a child would die, they put a small stone up, and then 40 years later or something, when the parents would die, they'd erect a large four-sided stone, and they'd erect it right next to the little children's graves, and so they put the children's names on the big stone as well. So it's not rare to find two stones with a child's name on it. The original stone, which they'd use as a headstone, and then on the big marker. Well, it says March 24th, it's hard to read the fours, but that is a four, 1841. And then you look at a little stone, it's March 18th, 1841. So it's six days off. So that lends to the lack of accuracy on the dates and ages on the stones. I have seen where three children are buried, and you add up, or you figure out when the children were born, and there will be two of the children were by, born five months apart. So, the accuracy on the dates on these stones is questionable. <coughs> oh, maps and deeds. I hope I haven't left something out. I don't know. <coughs> okay. Now, they had the old part of the cemetery, uh, and it was there. Well, they incorporated April 22nd, or they had a meeting in the town of anybody that was interested to make a formal organization of the cemetery. And I had the minutes over there on that table of that first meeting. So they met April 2nd, 1868, and it has a list there. I think most of you may have gotten one. It has a list of all the people that came to the meeting. And then they selected a moderator and they so selected a uh, secretary, and they also selected their directors. Two for one year, two for two years, and two for three years. And then they went on, and the purpose was to procure and hold lands to be used exclusively for a cemetery or a place for the burial of the dead. Now that was April 2nd, 1868. So we start a whole new phase of the history of that old cemetery. Now as we saw in those old pictures, the graves were all over. When I know when I copied them, I tried to put them all in rows, and when I got to that part of the cemetery, I could not figure out how to put them in rows. They just were all over the place. So, and that's the old part of the cemetery right here. What they did is they bought three new pieces of land, and I got the deeds all enlarged over there. And to be honest, I can't figure the deeds out very well. One deed is for three acres, and the old cemetery, the whole thing can't be three acres, so I'm not sure what the three acres is. But two of the deeds are dated November 16, 1869. So a year and a half after they organized, they bought at least two of the pieces of land. And then uh, in 1881, they bought the land for the schoolhouse. And this shows this, this peak to the house or whatever it is, that triangle up at the top, is the part of the cemetery that's up next to Bank Street. This part on the right is that park over in the back, just past where Captain Greg is buried, if you know where that is. 
And then they did sell lots right down, or had lots available for sale right down to Main Street. And I think they only sold one or two in there. They also have that path right here. It's a lane. That's that double line going down through there. The cemetery is not accurate in ways because the old part of the cemetery went off the flat part of the land and even over the bank partially, so I don't know how they could have a land over the bank. Also, proportionately, the map is not right. Now there's the first deed, P.S. Dudley and wife. Sixteenth day of November in the year of our Lord, 1869. P.S. Dudley and Lucia's wife. Now P.S. Dudley owned that mill down there behind the town hall. He also built that large house next to the Methodist church. And it really, it says, uh, being a part of the lot known as the mill lot. And he owned that mill, again, behind the town, behind the town hall. So, I'm not sure what that land is. It doesn't give any description. There's John Puff and Daniel Cavanaugh to Newfield Village Cemetery. Now, this deed is the same day. John Puff of Horseheads. John Puff had a hotel, was right where the old Baptist church is there above the covered bridge. And he sold that hotel, and then he started up a hotel over uh, in Horseheads, just down the road from that burned dairy. So that's why it says John Puff of Horseheads. He moved, he, he started a hotel over there, or bought one. And there at the bottom, you can see a lot beginning containing about three acres of land. I have no idea. No idea what that is. Oop. Oh, I missed one here. There's John Puff. Okay, the third lot is Frank Drake and his wife. And it was November 4th, 1881. And if you look at it, right there toward the top, I don't know if you can read it or not, it says they sold a schoolhouse lot. And it's being down at the bottom here, it's being the same premises conveyed to Benjamin Drake, now deceased, on the 16th day, 16th day of November, 1870, to Oliver Puff, or by Oliver Puff. So the schoolhouse land went to Benjamin Drake, and then his son Frank Drake sold it to the cemetery. Now there's Benjamin Drake Stone, and he died in 1878 and was buried in the land that was sold to the school, or to the cemetery in 1881. So it appears that these pieces of land were being used for the cemetery and the deeds were being recorded after the transaction took place. It's just that maybe the deed was recorded eight or ten years later, because it was obviously uh, being used as a cemetery before the deed. Now there's the top of that triangle on the old map. Well, the old map was dated 1869, November 1869, so it was a year and a half after they had their organizational meeting. And it was just days before they, the deeds were recorded. Now here's, here's the rows in what was the uh, yellow schoolhouse lot. And see they're nice and straight because they had the lots all laid out and measured and mapped. So a real contrast to the uh, older part of the cemetery where there was no organization at all. Oh, look at that. That is a document uh, recording the payment of the man that put all those spruce trees in. So the man at the top, the treasurer, was, his name was Benoni Anderson, and he was Lawrence Anderson's grandfather, and he lived where Lawrence and Ruth lived. 
and not many people know where Lawrence, I know you two do, but Benoni Anderson was Lawrence Anderson's grandfather. And Nick Pearson, M. Pearson is Nicholas Pearson. His father, uh, he grew up on Irish Hill just past the cemetery. But Nick and his brothers, Ed and Pierce, were big farmers down across from McGuire Gardens. And the Pearson house was that house uh, where the machinist local is. There was a huge house there. That was the Pearson farm. And so they paid Nick Pearson $100 for the evergreen trees. They were really Norway spruce for the cemetery. And it's signed by R.H. Estabrook. Who's R.H. Estabrook? Ralph Hurlbut. And what did he do for a living? He was a doctor, I believe. Yes, he was a doctor, and his uh, place was just east of the White House Inn. And he was a village doctor in the 1860s and 70s. So there it is. Now, a couple, three times when trees have gone over and we've cut the trees up and so on, I've tried to count the rings, and I have come up, I think, Three times we've been able to do that, and I have come up with a date around 1859 or 1860 when those trees were planted. But if they paid Nick Pearson $100 in 1870, I'm wondering if those trees weren't pretty good sized at the time, especially when I count the rings, I take them back a good 10 years earlier than that. So I imagine when Nick Pearson put those trees in, they were pretty good size, or else he wouldn't have gotten $100 for it. Isn't that quite a little sheet of paper? Now those are those uh, Norway spruces now. And there's the roof of a house. Who lives there? Okay. Oh, is that where I am? <laughs> so that house is kind of, that's a pretty good sized house there. So that house is dwarfed by those Norway spruce. Yeah, I wondered about those trees with the high winds that we had. Yes. I'm glad I'm not the president of that cemetery anymore. Go ahead. The, where, that, where the property is on Route 13, those trees came from, I just realized that there's, they must have grown trees there because that's the vet fireman. And look in the front of that property are the same trees that are here. Yeah. And they're the, probably the same age. I mean, they're gigantic spruces. They put a lot of Norway spruces up in the late 1860s and the 1870s. A lot of them are gone. But there were a lot of, there was a real fad for putting Norway spruce up. And then a little later, they had a big fad for putting sugar maples all around. They'd yeah. line streets, line streets with road. sugar maples. That's that was more like 1880 or so. But there were a lot of Norway spruces planted all over the place in the late 1860s and 1870s. Well, those spruces, by the way, are just a big pain in the neck as they are over here right now. So. Really? Yeah. They're, How do you get them down? <laughs> That's the truth. There's, not a, there's hardly a way to get them down. Human interest. Robin Anderson said I had to have human interest in here. <laughs> right? <laughs> and she might have been right. Oh, there's Freddie and Willie Starr. That's a sad thing. When I was a kid, you know, I lived three houses down from the cemetery on Bank Street. My father would say, and I had a brother two years younger, he says, you guys don't play around in that creek. Be careful of that creek. Two little boys drowned in that creek. And I say, well, who were they? He says, I don't know. But my, see, my father grew up in the same house I grew up in. He says, but when I was a kid, my used to tell us to stay away from that creek and be careful of that creek because two little boys drowned in that creek. So he didn't know who they were either, but he heard the same thing around the First World War. So then when I got talking to my grandmother about it, I thought, here's my chance to find out who those two little boys were because I remembered that the whole time. She said, yeah, when I was a girl, my mother told me to be careful with that crick because two little boys were drowned in that crick. <laughs> but my grandmother knew the parents. That was the cool thing. So they, they died 133 years ago. And I th think of it, my grandmother knew their parents. She actually knew them. What was their last name? Star. Oh. And uh, they, his name was Philander. And her name was Eliza. And they, they called them, and Lockery knew them as well. They called them Flan and Lida. And my grandmother said that Lida, well, her maiden name was Pearson. 
You know, they could be school teachers until they got married, then they couldn't be school teachers anymore. But my grandmother said Lyda Pearson, who was Eliza Starr, was her mother's first school teacher in the late 1860s. But these two little boys drowned January 8, 1880. They were playing on the ice just below the bowstring arch bridge, and the ice broke and they fell through and drowned. And I thought, and, and the, the boys lived over there in, uh, oh, Rick Boyle lives there now. The house was Herbie Drake's house across from the South Street Lodge. But I was thinking how devastated the parents must have been. They had three children. They had a little girl, Nellie, that was a year old. And they had Freddie and Willie. And they let those, that little three-year-old and five-year-old boy go off on their own, and they both died. So they were unattended at that age, that far from home. And uh, what the obituary said, something they played together in life, and they were buried together in death in a double white casket. Now here, I couldn't get a good picture of Elizabeth Starr's stone, uh, but her husband was Benjamin Starr, and Elizabeth Stone is on the left, Elizabeth Westover Starr. They lived on that farm across, on the upper side of the road, across from Little Tree Orchards. And Benjamin Starr died in February 1830. He was in his 40s, and they had 12 children when he died, and the youngest was a boy, another Philander star, different Philander star, and he was four months old. So Elizabeth raised those children all by herself. She never remarried. The oldest of the 12 had married. It was a daughter, Loretta, but she had the other 11 children at home, and she raised them all without ever being married again. And you're the one. I told you about Widow Star, and you didn't believe me, and I proved. I found a map that had Widow Star's name on it. But she was known throughout Newfield as Widow Star. Remember that? <laughs> she died in 1862, age 76. Oh, here's Thomas B., son of Samuel and Anna Young. And can you read it? It says, died by being stabbed by John Williams, March 6, 1838, aged 18 years. So it even tells who killed him. And there has to be a story to that. I've never seen any story. I don't know if you could find that or not. But it tells right on his stone who killed him. Now, I couldn't get a good picture of that because it was right under a Norway spruce and there's no chance of the sun ever getting across at noon. Oh, here's Horace Stewart, 1804 to 1902. He's the oldest person recorded in the cemetery uh, at the for oldest at the time of their death. He was 98. He lived right up here in uh, uh, Slater's house. What's it, what is it, Ruth? Right up in Ruth Slater's house. Uh, his wife was Callista Barnes. Her father was David Barnes. And so they had a son, David Barnes Stewart. He was called D.B. Stewart. He was the first mayor of Ithaca. And Stewart Avenue was named after him. And D.B. Stewart had a son, Owen, that became very involved with Cornell University, and he was instrumental in starting the School of Agriculture up there. And he had Stewart Park named after him. Oh, here's Bertha and Ada Moe. And they died two weeks apart, 10 years old and 6 years old. And I found their parents stone down above the Ithaca High School. A lot of children died, and a lot of them died within just a few days of each other. Well, there's three Revolutionary War soldiers buried in the cemetery. Captain James Young. Peter Puff. That's probably the one you were thinking of. Notice the willow trees and the decoration. And James Ford was the third. James Ford, my grandmother told me how James Ford grew up in Ireland, County Down, and when he was just a young teenager, they, the British impressed him into the British Navy. He didn't have a choice. They just took him and took him into the Navy. 
And so when he came over, it was just before the revolution, uh, he was camped down along the Hudson River in the British Navy, and he uh, deserted, and he swam across the Hudson uh, and joined the uh, Continental Army. But he was only 15 years old, and he couldn't fight, so he played a fife. And there's, who's that, Danny? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Captain Greg. We had a uh, dedication. What? Yeah, I went in there a couple weeks after that, and the stone was gone already. But Danny relieved my anxiety. <laughs> he said he knew where it went. I said, boy, that stone wasn't there two weeks, and it's gone. <laughs> oh, and did it. So Captain Gregg was a hero at Gettysburg, and now uh, many people believe that he could have been instrumental in the outcome of the Battle of Gettysburg. There's the last burial. Betty Rowe just died and was buried there four years ago. They wanted to be buried over in that old cemetery next to the trees. Now, when we went in there for Captain Gregg's new monument dedication on September 7th, Old Home Day, uh, a lot of people came to that. And a lot of discussion was had after the ceremony about the conditions of the cemetery, how deplorable they were. And I know a lot of you were there. Uh, and so afterwards, we stayed around and we talked. How can we take care of this deplorable condition? So I took a few pictures here. Now here's stones up toward the front. The stones are over and broken. Now that's the first stone I copied. I went and told my grandmother after I copied that first stone, I copied ZC House, and I said, who was that? She said, oh, that's Zell House. She knew him. Who's that, Joan? <laughs> yep. And see, there's a branch right down on top of the stone. There's an area that's heavily overgrown with teasels and just tall grass and weeds. Now there's an interesting part of the cemetery. Stones down, trees down among them. There's more, a stone knocked over with a branch of a tree on it. There's a tree hit that stone. You can see down at the bottom, it's knocked around, and also the top of it was knocked around. Thankfully, it didn't get it knocked over. That'd been an effort to put that back up. That's it. I was the president of this cemetery for 20-some years, and at first I gained permission. The, the, the state law is you have to have uh, a board of four. You have to have a president, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. And I received permission to be the president and as the only officer. Because one of the rules is you have to be descended from somebody buried there. So, but it got to a point, the reason, I, well, the state come after me and they said, you cannot do that anymore. I said, okay, because I was really concerned about that one big Norway spruce and I was concerned, there's a big crack up through there, and if we get a, a wind, it's going to crush that house. And I didn't want anything of that. I couldn't find anybody to take it down. And so I thought, I'm, I'm glad for this, and so I got out of it. But it's, it is the town's responsibility to keep that cemetery up. That's officially when I turned it over to the town and the money, it became their responsibility to keep that cemetery up. It became town property. It was officially abandoned. We no longer had a board of directors. So. So that eliminated just, her having to take care of it or what? No, they still go in there a few times a year. But, so, you know, when we, after our dedication at Captain Gregg's grave, we discussed it in our historical society meetings, and we wanted to, 
pursue getting that cemetery restored and maintained. And so this is basically why we're having this meeting to publicize it, get people to know more about this old cemetery, and create some sort of interest in getting it restored. And we got a number of people that are interested.